This meeting is being recorded. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to begin in just a moment. We're going to allow for uh, a critical mass of our over 1,200 registrants uh, join. Uh, and then we will begin in about uh, 30 seconds or so. So uh, you're in the right place. Bear with us. We can see you coming in. Uh, give us a wave as you come in so we know you're here. Uh, but thank you so much for joining and we will begin in just a moment. Hello everyone, my name is Matt Atkinson and I'm a Commercial Director here at Reuters Events Pharma joining you from London. Welcome to today's webinar where we will discuss your omni-channel strategy in depth. Uh, over 1,200 people closing in on 1,300 people have registered for today uh, and why? From events and search engines, emails, social media, face-to-face -face meetings and more, HCPs are looking for drug condition or treatment information everywhere. And it's challenging to, to deliver consistent and engaging experiences. Measuring HCP engagement is fragmented. So how can pharma companies create simple avenues for easy communication? The answer lies in providing personalized, value-driven journeys and content in a way that in which it doesn't overwhelm. Not only is this crucial to produce fully functional marketing campaigns, but also drive meaningful connections. During this session today, you'll hear from industry experts who will share their learnings on where to start, where to go, and thinking big and starting small. I wanna take a moment now to thank uh, Axiom, who are our partner on this webinar. Axiom enable people-based marketing everywhere through a simple open approach to connecting systems and data to drive better customer experiences for people and greater ROI for businesses. Before we introduce our speakers in a little bit more depth, I wanted to touch on some housekeeping. Uh, all the opinions expressed by our speakers today are their own and not their employers. Today is an interactive webinar. We're gonna be running polls as we go on. You can ask panelists questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. And you can use the chat function at the bottom of your screen also to chat amongst yourselves and with us throughout the webinar. And I cannot say this enough, but please do this as much as possible. Today's learnings don't have to come just from our esteemed panel, but that the interesting bit of info information might just come from our audience also. Finally, the webinar will be available on demand and the recording will be sent out on Friday. Now let's go to our speakers uh, and I'm gonna ask uh, Olivier to introduce himself first. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone uh, joining uh, this webinar. My name is Olivier and I have about 15 plus years experience within the healthcare industry, spanning from uh, medical devices all the way to, to pharma. Um, and most recently, um, working with Novo Nordisk, uh, heading commercial excellence and frontline excellence for an emerging markets region, um, where I'm heading of course also the, the planning as well as the execution of our multi-channel engagement to lead to superior customer engagement with our target doctors. Brilliant. Uh, Amit. Good morning, everybody. It is my pleasure to join the seminar today. Um, I am in US uh, East Coast, um, and I have 15 plus years of experience that it's coming, most of it's coming outside the pharma industry. Uh, I am a consumer product brand management experience for last seven years I'm working at Merck and for last three years I'm leading a team for digital marketing and data analytics. Thank you for for be I'm thank you to Reuter for inviting me on this end. Our pleasure. Uh, Giles. Hi, good afternoon and good morning everybody. My name is Giles Hall. I'm uh, from Axiom. I'm a sales director there. Axiom is part of the IPG network and as Matt mentioned Axiom is a marketing solutions company and we work with brands to help develop and deliver 
their marketing strategies and roadmaps to solve for the challenges that they see today and moving forward. Uh, and we primarily do this through uh, technology, data and people. And my role really is to go out and understand the needs from the industry and translate that into solutions that drive what we're going to be discussing today. Brilliant. And uh, Rania? Thanks, Matt. This is Rania Gobber. I am uh, Vice President, Head of Marketing for uh, Emerging Markets in Adriatris, a pharmaceutical company. I bring around plus 20 years of experience in the pharma field uh, through different roles, uh, but mainly marketing and digital marketing as well. I'm very happy to be with you today, and I'm uh, uh, connecting with you from New York, the US. Thank you. And uh, Michelle? Hi, I'm, I'm Michelle Tusher, and I am also based on, on the East Coast. I'm actually Boston-based, and I'm the industry <clears throat> principal for life science here at Treasure Data. I've spent the last 25 years in industry, and I've supported the growth and expansion of life science teams in strategic marketing and commercial roles. Uh, here at Treasure Data, I, I partner with flagship pharmaceutical and life science companies around the globe to lead enterprise-wide digital transformation journeys. Brilliant. And let's stay with uh, Michelle, who's going to share a little bit about uh, some of the trends treasure data are seeing in the industry and how they're tackling them. Yeah, super. And, and uh, yeah, I appreciate the time to be here in front of you. I'll just take you through um, a short presentation on, um, you know, what some of these industry trends are and the challenges. Um, you know, I want to start by highlighting some of the, the trends in life science that I've seen evolving in, in this marketing space. Um, you know, over the past few years. First, data is the center of, of every life science strategy. Um, and, and channels are blurring as, as pharma strives to meet healthcare professionals on their own terms. You know, we've, we've all heard, um, you know, meeting at the right place at the right time with the right content. And, and that's really what this is about. Uh, you know, HCPs engage differently now and, and they're not necessarily going to meet, meet us, right? We have to meet them uh, on their terms and, and where they are. Uh, another Im important trend I'm seeing is, is the definition of value has changed. So it, it no longer equals only clinical outcomes, or it no longer equals uh, a sole consideration of price or volume. Um, you know, there, there are other factors to consider in terms of value, and, and ultimately it depends on perspective. So how do we cater to that? Uh, personalization is, is a big one. Personalization is paramount and has, has really become the norm, if not the expectation, uh, especially with, with different uh, HCPs and customers and clinicians and, and uh, prospects. You know, third-party cookie de deprecation is, is, you know, something that, that keeps everyone up at night, I think. And, um, you know, in, in thinking about it, how can you increase the value of, of first-party data and, and get more of it? Uh, digital evolution is is reinventing the HCP experience. You know, digital evolution is is upon us, and technology like AI and machine learning, you know, enhance those interactions, and it's it's really changing the game there. Lastly, uh, you know, comes the realization that that pharma, be it sales or marketing, are evolving, uh, and they're stepping into roles now where they are recognized as as partners in care. Uh, next slide, Matt, please. Okay, so all of these trends really drive us to a new understanding of engagement uh, and, and, you know, the healthcare provider journey, the acceleration of adoption of digital, the growing complexity of privacy, uh, and the loss of third party cookies has left pharma with a fractured ecosystem that and that's, you know, really diminished their ability to understand their clinicians and as a result there can be significant decreases in the effectiveness of their of their marketing efforts or their campaigns. So that's, you know, something that needs fixing, it needs improvement. So in in talking to uh the field, we've conducted some surveys um, you know, in just our own perspective here here at TD at Treasure Data, we've bucketed common concerns in pharma companies uh, in catering to, you know, the new healthcare provider journey where, where healthcare is right now. So the first challenge is understanding the HCP, uh, overcoming that data and insight disconnect. Uh, data in the ecosystem is often disconnected with millions of scattered interactions in digital and non-digital systems mixed with multiple identities, uh, different consent preferences, and um, you know, different levels of privacy. It also refers to the disconnect amongst teams and divisions internally. 
So everyone pulling in a different direction holds back the ability to, to make decisions or the ability to experiment and innovate uh, in terms of marketing. So after we overcome that disconnect, uh, we need to share the understanding so that everyone can get on the same page and ideate from there. And that's you know where the challenges around operational insight comes. Um, with more data coming in every minute, the HCP understanding um, you know, is dynamic and how do we keep up with that? So marketers can struggle to unite around a common understanding of the HCP because, you know, the, the end game is to really un uncover the best steps that unlock potential with, with every interaction. Um, so optimizing there is, is, is really important. You know, in, in looking at the third bucket there, um, that, you know, that connection, um, smarter operations and engagement through optimized acquisition costs and, and lifetime value, um, you know, optimizing that um, customer acquisition and, uh, and lifetime value is, is a metric that is important to understand, um, you know, because you want to understand the amount of money that you spend on acquiring uh, your customers. So the key to optimizing this metric is to dynamically sync all the touch points, you know, your ads, your webs, your social, your call center data, uh, and campaign tools and to drive towards a meaningful conversation that, that drives uh, gains in efficiency. And then lastly, it leads you know, to, to the last point here, orchestrating connected experiences. Uh, you know, this is visible um, in the HCP journey. It's dictated by the care professional and it's spread across many, many channels. Uh, the business needs to sense the professional and understand where they are in, in their journey stage. Uh, and orchestrate the next best response to them, ideally with operations and engagement aligned. Um, you know, this allows the, the HCP as well to control timing and the channel that they're they're utilizing. So three key mantras here, um, you know, inform with education, respect with privacy, and then treat personally, right? Treat every interaction personally. So that brings us, um, you know, to, to our next slide. One potential avenue for, for solving these challenges along with other solutions meant to create the best customer experience possible is HCP Engage. Uh, Treasure Data in partnership with Axiom has developed a marketing platform designed to really inspire these deeper connections uh, with HCPs uh, using data. Uh, next slide, please, Matt. A connected customer data platform gives pharma brands the power to understand and improve their relationships with HCPs. Uh, and here, you know, I, I've listed out a few tips that enable your personalization efforts. So, you know, number one is bring all your HCP data into one place. Connecting these data points allows marketers, sales reps, customer service, and other members of the organization to have full visibility of that uh, entire provider journey and all the nuances that come with it. So the second thing you want to do is, is look to define new audiences and segments to drive personalized experiences. In a recent survey that, that Treasure Data conducted, we found that broad marketing messaging and sales outreach often falls flat, uh, and it's perceived as less valuable to HCPs because it's not relevant or personalized. So with a single view of the customer, teams can clearly uncover insight to define segments that inform more targeted messaging uh, and campaigns. Our third tip here is to equip sales reps with contextual data prior to interaction. So this you know, speaks to relevancy and, and the value that we noted in the trends. So interacting with sales reps is, is still an important part of the healthcare provider journey, uh, but how sales reps deliver value is changing and efficiency is key when considering cost, speed, and ROI. We wanna make sure that every touch point counts. Moving on to our, our fourth tip here, our research found that HCPs actively turn to digital tools and services to access information. So pharma brands here have the opportunity to use data gathered from these first party interactions to make strategic investments in improving capability and, and information offered online. Another tip, uh, use AI and machine learning to predict next best action for smarter recommendations. So not only does connected customer data inform uh, you know, real-time outreach, it can also be used to help predict and recommend the next best action to sales, marketing, and customer service. Um, and, you know, 
the goal here is to ensure that HCPs are nurtured uh, with that unified connected experience. And then lastly, you know, marketing initiatives are an ongoing process, right? So iterative testing and learning across the organization enables deeper precision in defining audiences and accounting for attribution uh, and even the development of new tools and services to better help providers. So with data delivered in real time, business leaders can make decisions quickly to optimize spend and maximize the value of their investment. Matt, next. So what does this process look like if we drill down a bit further? You know, what is, what is required? So really it's a four-step process. So first with the help of Axiom, we collect all of the data living in the multiple sources. So webs and apps and channel data, CRM. Uh, and then we want to connect that data. So here we integrate everything you know to, to essentially see your customer, like engagement history, consent, and identity information. And then next we build structure and define informed targeting. So here's where the journey orchestration begins and, and we think about what it looks like. And then lastly, we activate engagement. Accelerate growth with recommendations and, and personalization here. And then using gained foresight, hindsight and insight to optimize customer value with AI and data science. Next slide. So wrapping all of that up, you know, Axiom and TD have, have partnered to build a, a platform and a suite of services to help put your data to work for you. So leveraging that data to best engage HCPs and customers can help take, you know, your organization to, to the next level. Um, you know, happy to chat about that and, uh, you know, what that can mean for your business and organization. So thank you very much, Matt. And, and, and that's all that I have. Brilliant. Thank you, uh, Michelle. And I'm going to take this opportunity to get our audience involved now. So uh, coming up in front of you now should be our first poll question. What is the biggest challenge in adopting an omnichannel strategy? We have mindset, technology, skill sets, leadership, uh, organization structure, uh, or all of the above. Uh, and whilst uh, our audience and our panelists have the opportunity to vote on that, uh, Renee, I wanted to come to you first uh, and just get some, some broad perspective on why this topic is so important and by solving it, what are you enabling for your business? Thanks, Matt. And I think omnichannel in general is really critical for pharma companies today. It is, it is how we can transform our business. That is a very important uh, point. And if we think of COVID and how things evolved with the COVID, it's an eye opener for all of us. It really gave us the sense of how important it is for us as a pharma in the pharma industry to evolve and make sure that we are able to engage our customers in a different way. Our customers are online. They are actually very fast and very, very advanced in reaching information online. So for us to maintain, to be valuable to our customers, we have to uh, be able to provide them with the right tools and resources as well. And omnichannel for me, if I think about how can this improve and how can this add value to my business, again, if I am not able to provide my customers with the right value proposition in terms of content, in terms of experience, in terms of advanced content, that will enable even my field force to be able to engage the customers in a better way. I think that will be a big leg in the pharma company, uh, in the pharma industry in general. So. Bottom line, I believe this is the time where we really need to come up with better solutions, enhance and expand on the omni-channel experience for our customers, evolve our business models to integrate digital channels to our field force to enable our customers and enable our field force to better engage the customers in a more meaningful way and unlock the value of our business at the end of the day. So um, this is the time and I think it will be a very exciting journey for everyone. Brilliant. And I'm going to uh, end our poll now and share the results with you. Uh, you should see those coming up in front of you. Uh, unsurprisingly, 44% uh, all of the above. So lots of challenges. Um, uh, next, uh, mindset at 18%. Uh, structure and technology at 12%. H skill sets at 10%. And leadership at 4%. Uh, obviously, lots to get through there. Um, uh, Giles, I might come to you and just get your uh, initial reaction on those. Any surprises there or perhaps what you would have expected? 
Well, I would say my one quick observation on that is I would say that, that leadership 4%, I think that's a declining number year on year. I think that used to be an obstacle about this. There was a reticence towards this and, and an understand a lack of understanding around it. But if you look at and you read all the reports, there is a real uh, understanding of the value of being data led and being omni-channel moving forward. So I think that's a great signal that leadership is being seen less of an obstacle or a blocker for this uh, than it has been before. Mm. Uh, Olivier, Ahmed, any comments as well? No, I would say I'm fully aligned to to the outcome of the uh, the poll in the sense that it's it's not one that we need to get right. There's a multiple that we need to focus on. Uh, hence, I think all of the above was also my answer. Yeah. <laughs> it's not just one ticking off the box and then thinking we're done. It's kind of getting the full organization when it comes to the platforms, technology, people, the mindset, behaviors, capabilities in order to be successful. Yeah, good point, Oliver. I think. I, I picked one because I picked one. I like single-minded approach in this case. <laughs> I, all of above makes sense to us, like everybody else, but I think mindset is the one I picked up. And I think as Giles is talking about the leadership coming in, org structure evolving, technology is there. End of the day, we can have the best technology, the best org structure, the best data. If the mindset in the organization is not to make the change, all of this is of no use. And it's really the hardest, if I say from my personal experience, to, to do the digital transformation is that change management and mindset across the board, not only from a leadership perspective, but also across the marketing and the sales organization. Mm. I'm going to stop sharing those now. And uh, Giles, I'm going to come back to you for our uh, next question. For companies who have yet to kind of venture into their omni-channel journey or are struggling to get it up and running, um, what do you see that needs to happen to kind of get things started and what you've seen for successful companies at that start? Yeah, and I think it's a, it's a cliche, but the preparation is really key for this, for it to be a success. And, and we talk about six pillars of success uh, uh, when you're start, starting a journey like this. And we talk about evaluation, use case roadmap, data, operational readiness, planning and governance. So when we talk about evaluation, it's about really understanding what's the best technology, doing your research and understanding what's the best technology for what you want to achieve. Uh, do you need decisioning? How scalable is that te technology? Who are the end users likely to be of that technology? Is it your own in-house or as an external agency? So how, how user-friendly does that need to be for marketeers, for example? Then if we're going to things like use case roadmap, you know, we've got to be clear. What are your use cases that you want for today and for tomorrow? You touched on earlier, Matt, you know, think big, start small. So do some prioritization. You know, when you move into omni-channel, I think we put ourselves under a lot of pressure to go straight to amazing omni-channel, uh, uh, you know, within months. It's a real learning process and it's gradual. And unless you're working it that way, all those things we talked about, organizational readiness and things like that, that won't be there. You've got to create some high, high value use cases, test and learn, show the value, and then continue to evolve on that. So use case roadmap is really important. Data, and I've seen coming up in chat and Q&A, lots of things about data. So data is key to making this work, and it's really key to understand where the ownership of the data sits within your business, your permissions that you have for that data, where it sits, where you, how you're going to pull it in, and where you need to push it out to. So data is one that we see uh, as a real lots of initial engagement about we understand the, 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 the our data but actually when it comes down to things like data dictionaries and really getting a little bit more detail on that quite a gap uh, potentially in, in the documentation and readiness for the data that's going to be fueling these uh, solutions and then operational readiness um is everyone ready you know have you got smes ready to go on this is the, is everyone on board uh, and, and aligned to this uh, have you defined your operating model which we saw in the, in the previous slide uh, and things like training to ensure uh, adoption because again we've all heard or maybe even been part of uh, deployments where the technology is great but actually it hasn't been uh, embedded within into that business so planning sort of relates into operational readiness internal resourcing discovery workshops again really important when you're often bring together a number of partners to have these discovery workshops to make sure you're teeing up for success once you engage in the project uh, and then governance you know define your governance model make sure you understand how you're tracking reporting and who's got the responsibility you've got your have your clear racy 
and you're clear on your KPIs. So you know how you're measuring this to, you know, different stakeholders are going to have different KPIs within this business. So let's get that out early. Let's understand. Let's create the dashboarding up to the board level, to campaign level, to make sure that everyone can see, understand, and feel confident about what the solution is drawing for you. So that's what we talk about. The six pillars of success, evaluation, use case roadmap, data, operational readiness, planning, and governance. And if you do those things, you're certainly going to be ready uh, for, a, for a much more uh, uh, a quicker start to your projects and a smoother running of your project and getting the business on board. Renee, I've seen you shaking along throughout. Uh, yes, hundred <laughs> percent. These are very familiar, and I believe they are very critical in the journey itself. Because, again, what we have seen within the pharma industry that it's a trial and error. So, we've been doing a lot of stuff, but once you have a clear roadmap that really encompasses all of this, it's very important for us to take those steps. So. It is working. We need to define how we were making it more effective and really transform as we are going because it's not a one day and you will see an impact immediately, but still you are growing, you're experiencing, you're trying, and then you will see the impact at the end. Uh, having this governance in place, and I agree this is very important because having governance clear racing in, in place will give us clearer roadmap of how can we evolve as a company and really embrace this digital transformation in general so i can't agree more i think this is um, spot on i would, I would just and i'm really glad that you sort of agree as well Rania, but i would say you know the place is just doubling down on that test and learn Yes. Make sure you've got analysts, make sure you've got data scientists. This is what this is all about. You know, part of being this and you're self-sufficient and you're learning means you need people to invest in time and look into this platform, look at the data to enable your, your findings and create your next your next moves. hundred percent. But just one one thing again, in some countries where we have a presence, and I'm very specific to emerging markets, data is a big challenge as well. So it is not that easy to really come up with the data and really be able to link it to the same customer or be able to drive this. So we really depend on trends. And, and this is the beauty of Omnichannel because we still have the rep in the middle and the amount of insights that we get from those reps is very valuable for us. So they give us those trends. And we do have a, a, a big gap in data. So that's why we're trying to define some other areas where we're able to get some of those insights, able to get some of the feedback from the reps, having some ad boards. And again, we just, uh, we had an ad board at least within our area to really understand what the customer needs are. Again, and then build those journeys based on this expectations. But still, what I really want to say that customers are really keen to be able to be engaged through a digital channel, but they are still very critical in how they really want to keep the, the, the rep in the middle of everything. So this is how you start the engagement journey, and then you can build up with very uh, effective ways of communication that complement the field force. So we can customize and utilize the data based on the localization and based on the availability of the data in the market. So I don't want it to be a limiting factor, but it, it might be um, good to have in some countries. It might be amazing to have in other markets and really build on that. So just um, on the data point, but thank you so much. What's the, what's the workaround in those situations? Is there one where you do have a, a lack of data? Is it about um, you know, more intensively making sure you're tracking the data or tracking your engagement activities? Or, or is that something you just have to deal with until you have the, the amount of data available? Um, so it, it depends, and I'll give my perspective here. Uh, in some countries where we were able to get some feedback from the customers, this is where we are able to do that. We get, we get those ad boards, we, our focus groups, get some insights from the customers, understand, and then start to build the journey based on our expectations from a brand and a customer perspective. So it might be trends that we are following. It might be that we link it back to the revenues in some countries where we're ever able to have this, but still we might have net promoter score in some areas. We have market research in other areas, but really linking uh, data to a customer level data in terms of really seeing the impact, it, it would be very challenging in some countries and it would be very expensive in other markets where we did, do really have very limited resources as well. But I would say more of a feedback uh, uh, engine to, to able to get this data. Yeah, I, I, clearly huge variations by market and sort of data that's available on, on data maturity. I think to, to underpin that, you know, what we talk a lot about is what's your first party data strategy. So there are definitely challenges, but how are you thinking about resolving or increasing that? We, we see first party data 
as king. Uh, it's it's great because it's your your own, it's your insights, but also it's future proofing you. We all know changes that are going on in the industry, whether it's demise of the third party cookie. The stronger your first party identity graph is, the better position you are to garner your own insights, but also changes in regulation, changes in what you know the providers are doing to do that. So I think it's really important as well. Recognize there are challenges, see what's out there, but what is your first party data strategy to build your own graph to, to future proof you moving forward? Brilliant. Uh, Olivia, I'm going to come to you now and, and like Renee, you kind of tackle a few different areas. But what have you seen uh, in the best uses of a, an omni-channel strategy and where have you seen it have a major impact or a market on our community and, and what have you seen make it successful? That's a lot to, to unpack there. <laughs> I'll try to be as structured as possible. I think um, we, we alluded to earlier, right, which is the leadership. Yeah. And perhaps I want to go back to, to the senior leaders across multiple organizations. They've grown successfully, professionally, right, by knowing nothing else than a face to face interaction. Yeah? Uh, so it's mainly those markets, industries where, or companies where leadership ahead, for example, of COVID 19 started to collect consents, tried to tip their toes into, in terms of digital engagements they could have with, uh, with HCPs, uh, with, with patients. Uh, they were definitely ahead of the game in terms of adopting multi-channel at first and then omni-channel at the later stage. Yeah? So being early definitely helps in terms of making it successful. Um, and I think once you have that uh, senior leadership buy-in, when they put money where their mouth is, then of course it depends a lot on the internal organization. Um, and with that, I mean, first of all, uh, perhaps our frontline. Because yeah. um, there's um, a perceived notion that um, our medical reps yeah, might run out of a job once multi-channel, omni-channel fully takes off. And perhaps they have that, that sense of ownership, uh, that, that pride in that engagement with, with the HCP, um, which might be true, but it's not necessarily correct at all times. Yeah? So it's frontline that sees it as an opportunity to increase the share of voice with our target customers, or even uh, increase the, the, the reach um, with, uh, with customers that they are in remote areas within their, within their brick or their territory, that are the ones that are able to adopt multi-channel in, in a meaningful way, which means they can orchestrate or start orchestrating those engagements and not just rely only on the face-to-face -face engagements. Um, I think beyond the front line, uh, I think technology plays a role. Yeah? So the marketing automation tools that we have available should serve the business objectives, not the other way around, yeah? uh, which is that don't try to get anything off the shelf that looks shiny, uh, but really try to make it fit to the business objectives that you have in this omni-channel environment. Um, and I think the fourth one, uh, Matt, would be around the back office capabilities. And with that, I do not only mean kind of marketing colleagues that set out the strategy, and create the, the content assets, yeah? Because this is where, of course, um, it's easy to kind of try to jam as much content as possible into one omni-channel touchpoint, which is perhaps a trap we fell into when it comes to our face-to-face -face engagements. You have two to six minutes in the emerging markets to bring your messages across. However, in omni-channel journeys, yeah, you can use the different touch points to get those messages across. Not everything has to go into one go. Um, and so with that, I think also the medical, legal, regulatory capabilities, yeah, because when we talk about creation of content, there's a huge aspect of actually validate, validating it, approving it for market usage. Yeah, So there's a key element that is often overseen in order to make sure that we can have a proper lead time uh, to market. Now, Matt, if you, if you listen to those elements, these are all internally focused. Yeah, which is sometimes forgetting the customer. So I think a key element is perhaps also cultural context. Yeah? To what extent, uh, and in certain markets, there's high internet penetration, high mobile usage, and high variation across channels, but to what extent are actually HCPs yeah, open to engage with pharma, with the medical reps that they're used to in an omni-channel or multi-channel environment. Yeah? So this is a key element that is often overlooked and we just try to push our communication upon them rather than listening to the channels where they want to be heard. Otherwise, we're talking to a wall. And last time I checked, that's not as interactive nor fun. <laughs> so it's really kind of making sure that we have the customer at the center too. Brilliant. And uh, Amit, I'm going to come to you now. Before we uh, jumped on here, you said you're a, a data guy. So, um, you know, with the data you have, you know, what's some big, best practice you can share when it comes to extracting insights? Bob asked a question, I made a comment earlier in the chat about uh, 
Um, data can tell you what the weather might be, but it's not going to tell them where he plays golf. So uh, what's it about when extracting insights and then feeding this into a, a 360 customer view? And, and what lessons have you brought from your FMCG background as well? Yeah, great question. And again, I will try to be structured all over as well, as well to just answer the question in a context of healthcare as well as outside of healthcare. Uh, one comment I would make as I'm listening to, to this conversation and also experiencing firsthand the digital transformation in our organization is about think about a, a, a recipe you are preparing for in your kitchen. And it's very powerful for me to think that way because as you go out, you can see thousands of different technology. You will see many different ways you can collect the data, clinch the data, um, look at the data quality, first party versus third party and all these social media versus your own data versus sales data. If you think about that, I think we need to know what dish we are cooking, literally. And you may not need all the ingredients from the get-go. I think uh, Rania has also mentioned about, I think sometimes we always think about, I don't have that, I can't do that. Versus let's flip the mindset and say, okay, what can I do, what I have? But at the same time, if you're preparing a recipe, in this case, the professionals are, who gonna eat our food or the dish you're gonna make. So you need to make sure you understand them, you understand their, you can understand their personality, their personas. Once we understand their personalities and personas, then I think we can go after and think about the data. And if you think about the data, it's, it's a very common practice these days, like let's go after and collect all the data possible because we wanna create every touch point and we wanna do everything possible in those touch points. But the quality matters as much as the quantity, and the constant cleansing of the data is really important. Once you get the data, think about, it's not about gone are the days when data is used for insight. Think about how my data I can use to grow the business, how I can serve my customer better, and how I can move beyond that insight generation to monetization of the data. So I always use this 3M in my business when I think about structuring the journeys, structuring the data. First is maturity. We have to have the organizational maturity and that developed always ground up across from the field rep all the way to the leadership. Number two is the momentum. COVID has done a, accelerated the changes, I could say that. Um, but the trick is to keep that momentum going because what happened when we are in a long-term capability from a data perspective, that always get deprioritized for the fire rules we have on hand. So the maturity, the momentum, and the third part is the motivation. The digital savviness and the data savviness across the board is needed today. You may get the best data possible, but that need to really get into every piece of the touch point, whether it's content, whether it's the right customer, whether it's the right channel. And we need to constantly collect that and it, make it easy to consume across the organization. It's not a part of analytical team to just do that. And that's where I think the trick is. It's really hard. I, I'm just saying it all with, I can say it's all my dreams I'm sharing with you guys, but but end of the day, we need to start somewhere. Like never hesitate. I'm in an emerging market or I'm in a developed market. You will be surprised to find out each market has their own uh, shortcomings. So, so that's the mindset I go back always is that what can we do what we got data in the hand? And then how I can, and collaborate across the organization and outside of my company to really collect those data and help my sales rep as well as other departments who are touching my customer to provide them that insights. Brilliant. And I'm going to uh, come back to our audience now for our second poll, which you should be seeing coming up just in front of you now. Uh, where are you on your omni-channel journey? No adoption. Uh, low adoption, we know what it is, but it's still developing a strategy. Medium adoption, uh, we believe in the use case uh, in beginning. Uh, and high adoption strategy has implemented uh, and you are just about to pass go. Um, and whilst we uh, leave that open, we've had a, a good conversation now about kind of the, the, um, the structures of your data and perhaps we'll move on a little bit up to channels and journeys and content. And there is a, a movement to be more meaningful and empathetic with touch points and messaging. Uh, what best practices can you share when it comes to sequencing HCP actions and using analytics to uh, inform next best action? And I'm going to uh, leave that one open and, and hope one of our panelists will jump in there nice and quickly. 
Well, I can say share a point of view and would love to hear from other panelists as well. I think as we think about next best action, next best engagement, I think when I think about that, if you think about from a perspective of a sales rep, if they are in their account and they are interacting with them, they really know actually within their mindset and with their in their environment, like what is that next best look like? I think what we're trying to do here is that two things. First, we are kind of democratizing that next best action activities across the organization, number one. And number two is also helping our rep to see beyond what they can see. It is sometimes it's very easy for me to see my own sales and my own numbers and then interact with the with the healthcare. But if I think about that, can I can I provide my rep a broader view? that can really help them understand what can work and what cannot work. Gone are the days when a face-to-face -face was a just one touch point and as well as the rep is owning that account. I think it is now collectively we are owning it and this is where we are saying the next best action can be X, Y, and Z, not based on what the customer has reacted in the last conversation, but also how they reacted on the web environment, how they reacted on the social environment, how they reacted. I always tell people is like, think about a professional is as a human being. They are interacting with other businesses as well. And if I think about consumer product the similar way, you are taking a plane, you're using the app there, you're going to a hotel, you're using an app there. And as I said, with COVID, all of this touchless action has really raised the bar. And I will be really surprised. Why would a, a professional will keep us in a lower expectation when they're experiencing a better experience across the board with other categories. And that's what the real competition is sometimes. I would love to hear from other panelists as well. Yeah, I think yeah. I'd just say to that, that yeah, sorry, Olivia, uh, um, that th there are a lot of digital signals out there. You know, everyone has their own platforms that are coming. So I think it's the duty to ingest and understand those digital signals. I think, uh, you know, we all know, and I'll go back to my earlier point, it doesn't have to be a perfect journey. We don't have to be mind readers to do this, but we should use the data that is out there to make set to do the to, to do the next move, the next best action, and reduce mistakes. I think that's the most grinding thing is when there's something obvious and clunky where you're you're going backwards, you're not being understood about what you've already ingested, what you've already seen to continue that journey and be a, a sort of a two-way relationship as opposed to starting again. So I think it's challenges and different in in, in different um the challenge is different in different uh, channels that you work in, but when you have a website that P or a portal that people are interacting in and are often logged in, it's absolutely your duty to have that tagged up in a way that you can understand, garner, garner insights where they are on their journey, and then surface more useful information to them moving forward. Yeah, Jill, and then Amit, uh, perhaps following up from that, if we take a look at the, the sales model only, right, where face-to-face, -face, you can compare it a bit to a horse race, right, where you're blindsided and you're just focusing on your own race. And in an omni-channel environment, there's so much more data that can help you guide, right? You can under basically understand if you're ahead, if you're behind, or if you're simply on the wrong racetrack. Yeah? And so with, with, with this concept, it's a matter of making it digestible as much as possible in terms of that next best action. There was a comment in the chat around, data deluge, right? So how can we make sense of all the data that we are generating and building um, kind of nuggets, actionable nuggets that help our frontline um, move the needle from a business perspective? And if we take a look at it from an omni-channel perspective, to me, it's not 100% clear in terms of what that next best action might be. Because think of, we've perhaps all carried it back. We've been, we've been a sales rep in the waiting area of, of a hospital, waiting for, sh for the shift to take place so we can start meeting with, with ACPs, nurses, um, whoever it might be, right? And it's sometimes that initial face-to-face -face interaction that help you as a lead in terms of this is my next best action that I need to take in an environment where face-to-face -face is only part of the equation, right? How do we tackle that next best action from an omni-channel environment perspective? So what's the trigger that would need to take place if the rep would only be part of that equation? So that's an element that I'm still perhaps struggling a bit with, um, but uh, perhaps given that I have seen mixed um, outcomes in terms of the next best actions uh, across our organization so far. So I, I would build on that from my perspective, just give more of an example in terms of what we have been trying to solve this within our um, our uh, organization, at least within the company. Again, when we see we think about segmentation and how it is important, and I go back to the traditional way of doing business by the rep, uh, 
usually the rep is having value value segmentation. So they're cost, uh, segmenting their customers based on the value of in terms of the prescription generation. But when it comes to the per persona itself and the attitudinal segmentation, this is something that they rely on their insights. So they know and they engage and interact with their customers and they were able to build this person and their minds. When it comes to the digital interaction, this is where there is a gap because at the end of the day, you're trying to customize the content, customize the interactions based on the, the personalization of this, of this uh, HCP. And this is where we see the gap because at the end of the day, as a marketer, I am creating my materials that will suit the rep that can customize it from a messaging perspective with his HCP. But if I go to the digital space, I still have a gap in how I'm creating content that fits this persona. So in, in, in a nutshell, what we have done internally, we said I cannot have content for each type of customer. I cannot. That would be impossible from a resource perspective, from the amount of materials that I will generate, from, from the approval process, which is very lengthy. So what we said that let's segment our customers based on two main personas, I would say, or two main um profiles. Let's think about the patient-driven and a science-driven. And then based on that, we will say, we'll create content that fits the patient-driven customer group, which is mainly thinking about the patient, thinking about how can I really cure my patients, think more from an emotional perspective. And then the other uh, type of physicians are more about science. It's all about uh, uh, science-based medicine. It's more about evidence. And then based on that, the, the, the rep in the middle of those interactions, will be able to select the right content based on how we segment his, his customer. And then we can build the segmentation on, on top of the value base. So again, it's, it's a little bit way of how can we evolve our content and make sure that it is really targeting the right segment. But at the end of the day, it's really getting this value proposition that will enable us to engage our customers and, and shift. What is really important here, because you are engaging your internal reps as well and making sure that you are providing this their cap the capability they need so they are able to utilize those digital channels the right way so you're not replacing them you are building all those momentum bay or both those interactions based on their understanding of the hcp and how you can build on that with the right content so just sharing with you what we have done in in, in practice uh, within within viatra so to be able to drive this further so Rania, one example I will add on, like this is a great point, right? From a persona perspective. And this is one I brought out from a consumer product experience to the pharma in my experiences. So most of the time we do segmentation, we do persona, we get a lot of data and it's become a, within a realm of marketing, right? So marketing use it, they, they design the strategy based on targeting and then segments. What is help there is rather than creating, and sometimes um, I would apologize if I'm using a little bit more of a direct speech here, but I cannot hand over 100 page deck to my sales rep. They're very busy, they're in the car, they're doing a lot of work. So what can I do? So one of the approach I have borrowed from consumer product is where we are creating videos actually, two to three minute video. Think about that. If you meet with somebody for two to three minutes, you're gonna remember that person longer than you read a something about them in a PowerPoint deck, which is very much graphs and paper and numbers and all this kind of stuff. So what it does to us that we looked at the market, put it in a four different segments, and then we created videos, which we are calling personifying the segment to create that persona, mm -hmm. rather than telling them we are meeting with a personal focus, as you said, patient's focus versus revenue focus segment. We are saying, let's meet with Dr. Oliver or Dr. Rania and let us introduce you. And then, then it goes to tooth and end video. So the rep will spend about 30 minutes to watch three or four, but in their head, they will start clicking it back to their customer, which persona they fit into. And then I think modular content can help us, Rania, to your yes. point, then we need to provide the freedom to the rep with different, with digital, it's really easy. I can create three different kinds of sell sheets and I let rep choose based on the persona they are talking to because all of them end of the day are statistical clustering and they are not exactly true representation of the market, right? It's become really perfect when, when the rep start using it. So really great point, like understanding the who, then go to the why from the brand perspective, then understand the what. If we don't start with who, everything downstream doesn't help. And a hundred percent agree. Modular content is critical enabler for us to be able to drive the digital transformation. Otherwise, we'll be only having very limited number of materials, and that will uh, will limit our um, reach to the cost customers. 
Thank you both. I'm going to uh, end our poll now and come back to you with the results. You should be seeing them again in front of you. So uh, we're on your omni-channel journey. Uh, no adoption at 4%. That's always good to see. Uh, low adoption uh, at 34%. Medium adoption at 48%. And high adoption at 14%. Uh, Giles, you made a comment earlier about seeing leadership decrease. Where, what are you seeing here? Is that an increase uh, people at higher adoption than perhaps a, a couple of years ago? I would expect so. Yeah, I think so there. I, I, I think, you know, commonly where we see people is doing a much better job in multi-channel and really thinking about how to get into omni-channel. And I think probably that low to medium is really doing a good job on the multi-channel and then and then that that's a, that small percentage who are moving into that omni-channel side of things so uh, that makes that makes great sense and it's lovely to see that you know most of the people are on the on the bus now on the journey and there's only a four percent of no adoption uh, at least that four percent are here that's uh, on your journey uh, i would say now at least uh olivia uh, and that uh, where would you kind of see yourselves as well perhaps on this continuum yeah i, I would say definitely on, on the medium side yeah, uh, I think across the organization, there is great buy-in uh, to multi-channel engagement, where I think we try to not just replicate messages across different channels, but try to amplify messages across the different channels. Yeah. Um, however, that said, um, there is, and I'm, I'm seeing this across the industry, that there is a push perhaps to make sure that we have everything in place before we get started, instead of piloting, uh, doing one channel, get good at it, and then adding a next channel. Um, so it's, it's also a matter of prioritizing, perhaps, yeah? where we I try to understand what really matters to our customers. Let's try to make sure we're excellent at that before we jump onto the next bright, shiny thing. Um, where there's incremental value uh, to be driven. So perhaps once in a while, stepping on the brake, uh, I think would help uh, to show the value of multi-channel before we jump into the omni-channel uh, element. Yeah. yeah, so I put medium as well, Oliver, to your point. And I think there are a lot of questions I'm seeing coming through. We're asking for a particular example. So, so I'll share one example here is, the reason I say it medium is because if you think about it, and I think Alice, you made a good point earlier about connecting the dots. So for example, uh, we have seen, and this is the benefit of showing the value to the company, is that if somebody is in a web environment, which is more like you logged in and you you declare your identity, uh, which is first party now, or maybe you receive an email uh, from, from us and you clicked on it as a professional. In both cases, you're giving a signal, right? And then we made sure that signal is traveling through to our customer care team. And in this case, they can reach out back to the professional or they can hand this lead back to the, to the sales rep who can go in and already knowing that these conversations has happened coming back. I'm saying it because I'm still calling it medium is because there is still a lot of manual into this as well. So when it's benchmarking, it can be all automated. It can be logic. The AI and machine learning capability I'm looking at is mind boggling these days. Like they are so sophisticated. Uh, however, I think there is this inherent fear which is all for right reason is that what if, if something goes wrong, what is the machine does send an email to my customer, which I don't want to send. And this is where I think the manual is still there. So I think we are seeing, and I use this term all the time. I say, everybody like rabbit out of hack. That's my digital transformation. It's magic, right? You see it, got yeah. it. But I think behind the scenes, somebody need to put rabbit in the hat as well. And that's where I think the the magic is. So, so I put it medium because the bar is constantly increasing and the digital environment is becoming more and more sophisticated. And I think we need to catch up to that all the time. I think just hearing that and, and thinking back again to all the points we've raised during this session as well, I think another reason why there's quite a, a majority and low medium is I think that more people are buying the technologies that will enable them to do that, but they're now understanding or, or realizing some of the processes that need to be in place either upstream or downstream. I can't remember how many times today we talked about legal approval. So it's great that you could be real-time dynamic, send a personalized message, but in actual fact, most businesses aren't set up as a process to be able to do that because it still needs to go to someone in a room to review that creative or they don't, the creative doesn't exist to then go out. So I think there's a adoption of the technology of the center, which might be a CDP, but it's the processes uh, that sit around that that are still taking longer to maybe catch up with that. 
Thank you, everyone. I've got a question here from uh, myself was going to be about journey mapping and orchestration, but I've got one here from uh, Sergio from the audience as well. And he says, how do, how do you move from standard segmentation based on prescription potential to the behavior or persona segmentation without the risk to simply explode omnichannel complexity? Um, and uh, Giles, uh, I might pick on you if that's okay. <laughs> I, you know what we're talking about here when you when you're looking at deploying something like a CDP to help with this is that you are allowing for more dynamic segmentation. So you know historically CRM produces segmentation and people can stay in there. It's very hard for them to move. They, you know, they might stay in the segment for a long time. It, it, and this is, I think, again goes back to our learning curve. So this is about someone may start in a segment and you make rules about how they can move based on what they have been looking at on your website, based on interactions that you're getting back from your sales field team. And it just becomes, you're allowing that to be easier for it to be more dynamic for people to move across there. And then once they move to that new segment, then you obviously got your new roles and your new um, understandings about how you want to communicate with them. So I think this is, it's about planning, about creating your rules about how people can move within segments, but actual fact, it's not necessarily about creating more segments for you. It's just enabling you to understand what's the right segment for that person to be in at this time. And bearing in mind that that might be very different from one brand to another within your organization. It's not, it's not static for your whole organization. You've got to enable for, allow the complexity of your different brands that, that ACP might be engaging with. Hmm. And I'm going to uh, stay with the audience. Now I have a question from uh, Osman near the start. So I apologize for taking a while to get to this, but he says, um, pharma hosted content and channels are not the initial preference of HCPs in most cases. How can pharma overcome this and create more trust? Uh, and Renee, I can see you uh, Yeah, so I'm hundred percent. And I think I a hundred percent agree because at the end of the day, if we think that the, the digital channels in general is uh, an additional channel for brand promotion, then we definitely will be, um, I don't think we will be able to succeed as we are expecting. But if we think that the digital channel content that will fit the customer needs and make sure that it's not biased in a way that they will be able to consume this data, consume the information that we're providing to them, have the confidence that, that the resources that we're providing is for their benefit, at that point, we will gain their trust and they will be able to consume whatever information we're providing them. So we need to be customer centric in our content rather than being brand centric. If we really think just some brand promotion, that's a, it's an additional channel. They can read anything about their brands. And, and I would refer back to the, the ad board that we had a couple of weeks ago. They said the, the physician said clearly, as long as you're providing me with value added services or information that will really help me in my business in my career, in my uh, ability to, to manage my patient, to treat my patient, I'm open to receive anything. But if you're using those digital channels just to provide me with more brand information, I can get it from every, anywhere. So unless there is a value for me, I won't be able to engage with you. So this is where we really need to define what are the customer needs, what are our offering as a company, and where is this common value proposition that we can provide them relevant information that feeds their practice. But at the same time, me as a company, I'm gaining the trust, I'm gaining their confidence, I'm adding value to them. And definitely I'll be the partner of choice. It's more about the partnership rather than just being promotion, promotion, promotion all the time. That to me would be a, a critical uh, success factor for, for digital expansion. Brilliant. And we have uh, about two minutes left. Um, just a reminder, we will be sending the recording on Friday uh, if you've had to join late or you want to share with colleagues. But I want to get maybe uh, a 30 seconds uh, final piece of advice for our audience. Uh, and I'll come to Olivia first um, for final piece of advice for people uh, in the omni-channel journey. Uh, what would that be from you? That's a very good one. Um, I would say... Um... Test, test often, um, quit early if you see that something's not working. Um, and that's, I would say, mindset, I think above anything. Um, yeah, test, quit early, mindset. There you go. I like it. Uh, Amit? Yeah, I would say uh, 
one of the things we need to get outside of the box is understanding the professional beyond just being professional. They are human beings as well, and they are interacting with different brands and different places. So if we need to understand, like somebody asked the question about attitude versus segment, start with attitude, start with behavior, understand how they are interacting, and then start to cater to Rania's point. Do not use it just to promotion, promotion, promotion. It has to be really the value added content or the services where they are in the journey. Brilliant. Uh, Renee? Yeah, again, and more. I think we are uh, we are all aligned on this, and it's all about uh, the the belief that this is working and uh, transforming our approach to digital channels. Fantastic. And uh, Giles, I'll leave you with the uh, the last word. I'm going to go back to think big, start small. Know what your vision wants to be, but be you know be tight in your initial engagement and grow with it. Do it organically. I mean, that is the way that you're going to get your organization on board and everyone feeling comfortable about the change that you're bringing into your organization. So think big, start small. Brilliant. Uh, all our panelists, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, that's the hour. Uh, we've run out of time, but uh, thank you so much again for everyone uh, for taking part. Thanks for Axiom for partnering with us. Uh, if you want to learn a little bit more, I'm sure Giles will be open to uh, connecting on LinkedIn or uh, reaching out on I. We can help connect as well. But finally, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.